Good morning, everyone. Good morning. God is good. That's for sure. Um, just a couple of announcements. If I get them straight in my head now. Um, yeah. I don't know when uh, camp is going to be on for teens. That's kind of still up in the air. So I'll let you know when that happens. Um, I'm going to see Heather tomorrow. I'm going down for a quick visit down there. Um, on the 16th, uh, we have the Delmores from Marguerite. They, uh, it's a family of 10. Anyway, they're planning to come and, and, and they're going to sing two or three songs for us on the 16th as, uh, during our church service. So that'll be nice. Um, I don't know if I had anything else. I think the bulletin will be up afterwards. And if you're a uh, guest here, uh, you're welcome to stay for lunch afterwards. We always have lunch together, and there's always lots. So, where are you folks from? Oh, that's not too far away. It's great. Nice to have you with us. Well, let's stand and sing together. This is my desire. my heart I worship you yes all I have within me I give you praise all that I adore is in you Lord, I give you my heart, give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm away, Lord, have your way in me. Yes, this is my desire. To honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Yes, all I have within me, I give you praise, and all that I adore. Is in you, Lord. I give you my heart, I give you my soul. Oh, I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away, Lord, have your way in me, Lord. I give you. My heart, I give you my soul. Yes, I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. Yes, I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Father, we thank you that we can come um, to this Lord's Day morning and worship you. Uh, with our songs, Lord, I pray you just be pleased and, and glorified and that... Uh, we just be, we be encouraged, Lord, and we love you um, all the more. Uh, Thank you, Lord. Father, give us a, a desire to, to know you and to love you and yeah. um, to share you with others. Mm. Yeah. Pray, Lord, that our worship here this morning would, um, would just be amazing. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. God is amazing. It's wonderful to know him, to have him as your Lord and Savior. 
when you do, when you discover who Jesus really is, then it's, it's all for Jesus. When you only see him dimly and you're, you're, you're fixed, your eyes are fixed on the world and its ways and everything else, then, then you don't quite see Jesus as he is and your heart begins to drift. But oh, to be able to say today, Jesus, all for Jesus. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have, and ever hope to be. ever hope to be all of my ambitions hopes and plans yes I surrender these into your hands all Ambitions, hopes, and plans I surrender these into your hands For it's only in your will that I am free For it's only in your will that I am free. For it's only in your will that I am free. Jesus, all for Jesus. Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. Oh, what a lesson we need to learn often in life when we become so tied up in knots over so little, things that are so inconsequential, and all the while Jesus is there. And he's saying, trust me, my child. Trust me. If I take this away from you, trust me. If I give you this, trust me. We are so fixed in the temporary. And we, we think is going to bring us pleasure. Or we think is going to bring us relief. But it's never the case. I can remember a time in my life when I thought, oh, if only this is resolved, I'll be a happy man. And it got resolved, and it was a hard situation. And I, I realized that's not where my happiness lies. My happiness lies in Jesus Christ in every given moment, trusting him. He's everything. His amazing grace is towards us, not only to get saved, but to live every moment. God's amazing grace. Amazing grace, I speak the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. 
This next song is often uh, kind of uh, reserved for uh, Christmas, but it isn't just a Christmas piece. It starts with a borrowed stable, but it goes to a cross and the resurrection and the coming of the Lord. From the squalor of a borrowed stable, by the Spirit and the Virgin's face. To the anguish and the shame of scandal Came the Savior of the human race But the skies were filled with the praise of heaven Shepherds listen as the angels tell Of the gift of God come down to men Heaven now the friend of sinners, humble servant in the Father's hands, filled with power and the Holy Spirit, filled with mercy for the broken man. Yes, he walked my road and he felt my pain. Joys and sorrows that I know so well. Yes, His righteous steps give me hope again. I will follow my Emmanuel. Through the kisses of a friend's betrayal, He was lifted on a cruel cross. He was punished for the world's transgressions. He was suffering to save the lost. He fights for breath. He fights for me. Loosing sinners from the claims of hell. And with a shout, our souls are free. Yes, death defeated by Emmanuel. Now he's standing in the place of honor, crowned with glory. 
glory on the highest throne, interceding for his own beloved, till his Father calls to bring them home. Then the skies will part as the trumpet sounds, hope of heaven or the fear of hell. Spirit and the virgin's faith To the anguish and the shame of scandal Came the Savior of the human race Amen. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. We praise you that you've come to be the Savior of the world. We thank you, Lord, that you're coming again. We thank you we can be ready for your coming, that we can be prepared, Lord, because we know you and because we walk with you. We surrender afresh to you this morning, Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Oh, God, why would anyone ha hold back from giving their whole heart and soul to you? Because you've given everything to us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Time for a puppet show. <laughs> Well, well, well. I got big news, big news. Hey, how are you doing there? Hey, good to see you, Bert Bunny. Listen, I've got good news. <laughs> what is it? What is it? Well, there's a, 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 a dog, a new dog in the village. A dog? Ooh, I, I don't really like dogs, you know. Well, this one here, his name is Sparky. And uh, he's, uh, he's really, um, well, I think he's a wonderful. Sparky, Barky? Oh, yeah, he, he, he can, sometimes he comes up behind you and surprises you. Oh, no, <laughs> I don't know if I like this at all. Well, I, I gotta go tell everybody else. A new dog, Sparky. Hmm, I don't know about this at all. This is making me kind of nervous. Dogs. I don't like dogs. He said his name was Barky, and it comes up behind you, probably grabs you and eats you. Oh no. Oh, I'm scared. Hey, good to see you. How you doing, Bert Bunny? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really scared. Oh, what are you scared about? Well, it's, it's a new dog. There's a big, big Barky dog, and he comes up behind and grabs you and, and, and eats you and bites you. Oh, oh no, really? Berkey, oh, oh, I'm scared too. Oh, yes, we all should be scared of the big Berkey grab behind you, bite you dog. <laughs> oh no, oh, I'm gonna have to tell everybody. I hope I don't run into it. Oh, me too, I'm heading for my hole in the ground as quick as I can go. Okay, we'll catch you later. I'll, I'll, I'll tell everybody. Okay. <laughs> Oh no, this is terrible. What are we gonna do? Oh, this big dog. This great big ugly dog. Yeah, I heard about it. Where is it? Oh, I hope it, I gotta keep an eye out. Oh, oh, I better head back to the barn too. I better, I'm gonna tell Millie. Oh no. Oh, oh no, yep, yep, yep. dog. Is there a big scary dog around? I don't like scary dogs. Well, yeah, but Bert Bunny told me that there was a big scary dog named Barky who jumped up behind you and grabs you and, and bites you and eats you. Oh, it is me. Do I look like a big scary dog? No, you don't. Oh my goodness, somebody must have got confused. 
Sometimes people tell stories and then they add a little bit more to it. Happens a lot in Cape Breton, by the way. <laughs> what a will. Um, you're not scary? Do I look scary to you? No. Yep, 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 yep. That's a cute little bark you've got. Yep, thank you. I like barking. Wow, you look like a friendly dog. There's not another big scary dog around named Barky, is there? Nope, I'm the only one. I just moved in the neighborhood. And I, I saw Percy Pig, and Percy Pig was so friendly. Oh, whatever happened? Somebody must have told the story and added to it and then got scared and, oh my goodness. Well, hey, we can be friends? We sure can. Yep, yep, yep. I like you. Wow, I got a friend. His name is Sparky. Not Barky. Not Barky, Sparky. Yep, yep, yep. Well, you sure like to bark. Yep, yep, yep. Well, will you want to come over to the barn and meet Millie? Yep, yep, yep. Hey, that's one way of saying yes. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, well, let's go down to the barn and I'll introduce you and maybe we can find out who got all confused. It was Bird Bunny, Bird Bunny, that's right. Bird Bunny said that you were big, scary, ugly. I think I said you were ugly. Oh, yikes, I added something too. Wow, okay, well, we should be very careful not to talk about other people and not know what we're talking about. We tell you, sometimes we listen and we hear the wrong thing. We should go by the truth. Yip, yip, yip. Okay, well, let's go down to the, to see the, the Millie, do you like milk? Yip, yip, yip. Oh, this dog likes to say yes all the time. Yip, yip, yip. Okay, well, let's go. Yip, yip, yip. <laughs> and this morning, you have a really special treat. I'm going to sit down. I'm not going to preach, so. Jonathan is preaching this morning, so. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied. In your presence, I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Your beauty to find you in the place your glory dwells. One thing I ask, and I will see to see your beauty to find you in. The place your glory dwells. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. And flesh cry out for you, the living God. 
Your Spirit's water for my soul. I've tasted and I've seen, come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Thousands elsewhere. I'll just quickly open up in prayer. Uh, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you, Father, for your mercy and your blessings. Um, there'd be no library on earth that could hold all your blessings that you continually uh, bestow upon us, Father. Uh, we are just constantly in awe how good you are, how faithful you are, Father. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would open up our hearts to your word. You would open up our minds to your word, Father. I pray that... Uh, that we would live your word out, Father. I pray if there's anyone listening online, Father, that the word spoken today would truly go into their hearts, Father, and that they would examine, examine themselves, examine their heart, and see if they truly are in the faith. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm, it's a privilege here to, to speak to you guys today. Uh, as always, when I, when I give a message, it's usually something that's really touched my heart, convicted me, and I feel that it's a message that should be shared to everybody. So about two years ago, my brother, um, he found the Ligonier map, and if anybody knows the Ligoniers, um, amazing resource. Uh, they, their app has all kinds of articles, uh, commentary on parts of the Bible, but they also have teaching series. And it was the winter time, and I was plowing the driveway. We had a huge snowstorm. So I got my iPod out, put on my earphones, and kind of went through, what, what am I going to listen to while I plow the snow? And I found the parable of the ten virgins. I'm like, oh, well, I guess. And I looked at it, and it was like a six-part series. I'm like, it's not a long parable. Like, how, how much information can this guy talk about? So I put it on, and by the end of me plowing the driveway, I've never felt so convicted in my life. Like, just this parable. And I've, I've heard this parable many times, and I didn't think anything of it until listening to this six-part series. Uh, it was by John Gerstner. And so I th it's been on my heart for a long time, and I feel that I should share this with you guys. So before we read it, I'm just going to give a quick little context. If the youth group remember anything, context is context. It's key. Um, so this is in Matthew 25. So Matthew 23, Jesus gives the woes to the Pharisees. He's basically putting the Pharisees in their place revealing their hypocritical hearts, that these guys who are supposed to be the religious leaders, they're not. They're not the good shepherds as they should be. Then in, in Matthew 24, um, this is when Jesus starts talking about his second coming, things to come. He talks about the, the, the abomination of the desolation, and Pierre touched on that last week, the coming of the Son of Man and the lesson of the fig tree. And then finally, no one knows the day or the hour when Jesus will return. Not even the, uh, not even the son will know. Um, then, chapter 25, verse 1, he starts with this parable. So the context of what's happening here is he's talking about the second coming of Christ. So keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that he gave a bunch of parables 
emphasizing when Jesus returns, we should all be ready. So let's keep that in mind when we read through this. So it starts Matthew 25, 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in t with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So... For me, it's, it's just a quick reading of it. It seems pretty uh, straightforward. As Christians, we should always keep watch. We don't know when, when Christ will return. But there's a lot of golden nuggets in this parable that it's so easy to look over. So first off, Jesus is really depicting a historical wedding, a wedding that we're not used to. It's 2022 North America, our weddings, are held at daytime. That time, the last part of the wedding was held at night. So usually with the wedding, there was three parts to a wedding. First, it was an agreement between the two fathers, the father of the bridegroom, of father of the bride, the father of the groom. They agreed, okay, my daughter should marry your son. Yes, that sounds like a good, good agreement. They arranged it. It wasn't a, like a full-on arranged marriage, but it was pretty close. The bride and the groom had some say, but it was mostly between the fathers. Um, the second part was the taking of the vows. This was between the bride and the groom. They would then exchange vows. There was people, witnesses there. They would exchange gifts. That was, once they exchanged vows, they were legally married. It wasn't fully, she didn't live with him. Um, it wasn't fully consummated, but they were legally married. So if they were to split, it would be an, an actual divorce. After the vows were made, this is really cool. I like this part. The husband or the groom, he had one year to go back and build a home for his bride. He had one year. So she waited at her parents. Now, either he built on an extension to his family's home, or he would go out and build his own home, or he would actually maybe buy more land and plow. Whatever he had to do, he had to make sure that he was able to provide for his wife and prepare for her. Once everything was ready was the last part of the wedding. It was the celebration, the banquet, and that could take a few days. It was a huge party, huge celebration that the entire community was part of. And it was probably one of the most joyous celebrations that the community was part of. Everybody was involved. And so once the last part of that celebration, the bride and her bridesmaids would all go to her house where she grew up and they would wait for the groom to come with his groomsmen. And they would march down, they would open up and they'd say, I'm now going to take you and bring you to my my home and your new home. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And that was just how they celebrated their wedding. That's how it was done. So Jesus is just explaining this, but for us, it seems so foreign, so different to us. Like, why was it at nighttime? It was a beautiful thing because as they would go to his new home, they would deliberately go through the town and all the bridesmaids, it was their job to shine the way with their lamps. And they would shine up the streets and show like the bride and the bridegroom are coming and everybody would be excited. Everybody would be so happy for this, this new couple. So that's the historical context. That's why it might seem a little strange to you. So let's now pick it apart. So 
at the time, the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus always uses this. He says, um, the kingdom of heaven is near. A lot of times that's referring to his reign. And it's not simply talking about some kind of, it's not talking about a a geographical location. It's talking about his reign. A king reigns in his kingdom. Where does Jesus reign? In our hearts, right? Now there will come a time when everything is finished that Jesus will reign over everything. And he is, even now, fully sovereign. There's nothing that happens that's outside of his plan. But there will come a point where everything will be fully within his kingdom. But right now we're talking about the rain in our hearts. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. Now, the word virgins might throw some people off. Again, at that time, bridesmaids were usually young and they were unmarried. So that word, basically, you could transfer it with bridesmaids. So kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps... Now again, these lamps, they were not like this small little lamp or a little flashlight. They were more like a huge torch that you'd put your cloth on and you'd put oil on top of it and you'd light it. And once the cloth got fully burned, you put more cloth on or if the oil ran out, you put more oil on. So they took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now remember, the bridesmaids, that's their job. Their job is to light the way. Kind of like the... The ring bearer, he's got one job. He holds the ring. Their one job is to light the way with their lamps. They went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them... It's not showing up there, eh? Oh, no. Yeah, some of the the fonts are going to be... You know what? I'm just going to go back and we'll, we'll do it this way. So... He went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. So right away we have ten bridesmaids. But he makes a distinction. Foolish and wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. So I want you guys to think about that. Okay, he makes this distinction. There's the foolish and the wise. And what makes the foolish foolish is that they didn't take any extra oil with them. What does that mean? What does that represent? They were unprepared, made them foolish. Now, how does that apply to us as Christians? Yes, and that's exactly how it ends, is that we must always be ready. Now, I'm going to make this point. They were all bridesmaids. This, and this is what really hit me, is that this parable is not for non-believers. This is for the church. This is for every one of us here right now. So you could almost say that some of us sitting here today, some of us listening uh, online, is either going to be a foolish bridesmaid or it's going to be a wise bridesmaid. And the question is, who are you? Are you foolish or are you wise? Am I? What am I? Am I foolish or am I wise? It's... It's not talking about the world. Um, John MacArthur says this. He says, it's not talking about people outside the church. These are people who know the bridegroom. They're part of the, the wedding ceremony. He said, they're not drunkards. They're not fornicators. They're not slanderers. They're not atheists. These are not agnostics even. They're not even antichrist. They're not the forces of hell. They're not demon-inspired. They're not involved in the, unco- in the occult. They're not non-religious. A lot of these, these could represent religious people who go to church every day, people that read their Bible, people that pray. The Pharisees prayed. Did that mean that they loved Jesus? They hated Jesus more than anyone. Um, and yet, so this parable is directly for the church. It's for professing Christians, people who profess to be Christians. The bridesmaids, they're all bridesmaids. And you can almost look at it this way. If you were walking by and you just saw these 10 bridesmaids, they would all look the same. You would see no distinction. You would not walk by and be like, oh, there's five foolish, there's five wise. No, you, w- you wouldn't know. 
The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. That's what distinguishes the wise. They took oil along with them. And again, to give that historical background, you have this huge torch. It's lighting up the way as you walk. Eventually, that oil is going to run out. Of course, you're going to have oil, a jar beside you to keep on putting oil on so that the fire continues to burn. That's the example of the wise. They had extra oil. The foolish didn't. Now, the bridegroom was a long time coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. This is not a condemnation. This is not a bad thing. It says for us to always be ready. What does it mean to always be ready? Does that mean that we always have to be awake at all times? Keep our eyes open. Do not fall asleep. We might have to make a shelter in our basement and store up some goods, maybe make a bomb shelter because, you know, the Armageddon, it's pretty scary. Is that what it means to be ready? What does it mean to be ready? Yes, spiritually, in your heart. Not physically. Not, you know, I have to go get a gun out because when Christ comes back, it's the Armageddon and I got to defend the church. No, when Christ says to be ready, he means in our hearts, spiritually. We have to spiritually be ready. That's what the wise did. They were prepared. They had extra oil in their lamps. The foolish didn't. Now, to drive this point home, the foolish were not just Christians that... made a mistake or, or two. These are people that look like Christians and are not Christians. These are people that act somewhat like Christians but are truly not Christians. These are people that live their whole life going to church, doing all the good things, but they have not been transformed in their heart. And that's why the distinction here, the foolish and the wise, can only truly, truly be made by Jesus himself. It's really God who knows the hearts of men. We look on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so as we go through this, I'm going to ask you guys not to be pointing at people, people that you know. The main point here is to examine yourself. Just like in 2 Corinthians, Paul makes the point, you've got to examine yourself and see if you're, if you're in the faith. And so as Christians, at some point... You shouldn't be doing this all the time. You shouldn't be like, am I saved today? I don't know. That's not what we, we should have an assurance of our salvation. But you should be a wise Christian. You should know that you truly are saved in Christ, not by your works, but in the saving faith of what Christ done on the cross for you. And if you are not living according to God's word, if you don't look like a Christian, if you don't talk like a Christian, if you don't smell like a Christian, then you might not be a Christian. And you might have to examine yourself and see if you truly are in the faith. And this is what this parable is getting at, is that they look all like bridesmaids, but five of them don't fulfill their duties. So, the bridegroom was a long time coming. They all became drowsy and fell asleep. That's fine. You know what? It's been 2,000 years. Christ hasn't come back yet. But that doesn't mean that we give up hope. That doesn't mean that we're still not always ready. This isn't, that does not mean that we're still not always prepared spiritually in our hearts that Christ will return. Then at midnight. And this doesn't mean simply like Christ is going to come at midnight. No, it's just emphasizing the point that at the latest hour, when they least expected it, that's when Christ came. At midnight, a cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. I'll get back to trim, trim, trimming the lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. They didn't bring oil with them. The first thing they thought of is, Let's ask the wise for some extra oil. The wise one said, no, um, there may not be enough for both of us. Instead, go and buy some 
uh, go to those who sell oil and buy, buy some from yourselves. This is not a non-Christian thing. It's not like those wise ones are so stuck up. They're like, no, you didn't bring your own oil. <laughs> Fend for yourself. If I didn't say it clearly, I'm going to say it now. The oil represents salvation. That's what, the, that's what the oil represents. The oil in your lamp. It's true salvation. Now, if I'm not saved, and I'm like, and Jesus appears and says, Hannah, please save me. I want to be a true Christian. Can you save my soul? Save my soul, Hannah. Is that possible? Can Hannah save my soul? No. And so, of course, the wise cannot give them oil. That's something they can't do. Only saving grace comes from Christ himself. And so, again, it speaks to their foolishness. It speaks to their empty heart that the first reaction these foolish virgins do is they look to the wise and say, give us some of your oil. You know, when you almost read this, maybe they were expecting that all along. Maybe they were like, you know what, we don't need to bring extra oil. We'll just get some from uh, the wise ones over there. Whatever the case, they didn't have oil with them. They were not prepared. They were not truly saved. So the wise one said, well, no, you have to go back to where we all get the oil. And for them, that probably meant back in town. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. That is such a terrifying little sentence. One, two, three, four, five. Five words. Well, yeah. The door was shut. Just like in the time of Noah. Noah, well, it was 125 years of preaching and telling people that, um, getting them to repent. Nobody listened. He built the ark. All the animals went in. His family went in. And God himself shut the door. The door was shut. Once that happened, nobody could enter the ark. The way of salvation was shut. What a scary picture that is. Picture yourself at the time of Noah seeing this huge ship, the only thing that could save you from drowning, and the door is shut. Not by human hands, but by the hand of God himself. There is no chance for you. What a scary thought. The door was shut. Later, the others also came. So now the foolish. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. Now, take notice of how they respond to the groom. Lord, Lord. These are people that know the bridegroom. There's a word ca called orthodoxy. They had proper knowledge of God. They had proper knowledge of Jesus. These are not people that have never read the Bible. These are not people that has no understanding that Jesus is the Son of God. But you can know a lot of knowledge about Jesus. You can know a lot of knowledge about God and still not be saved. That's what's so scary, that even the demons know and tremble of God. They know, right? The demons know God. They know of him, but they don't know a true, full, loving relationship with God. And so they call him Lord, Lord. Yes, if any historical person out there, that word could be simply transferred or translated into Sir, Sir. But there is deeper meaning behind that, that they are really referring to his deity. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. That is the second part that just scares, scares me. The door is shut. Truly, I tell you, I don't know you. What a terrifying thing that you live all your life going to church. You live all your life hearing the word of God. You live all your life sometimes praying. And you somehow convince yourself that I'm okay. I'm all right. And then suddenly you meet Christ face to face. And he says, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. And then therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Um, to go to this, I, I, I also don't want to leave people in despair thinking, 
maybe I'm not saved and you really are saved. Um, there's two things, right? Like, yes, at some point you have to examine your heart. Um, examine yourself. Am I really in the faith? Do I really walk in the spirit? Do I really um, imitate Christ? Do I really have a true saving faith? But I want to make the point clear. I don't want people to think, you know what, it's all right. It doesn't really matter. I'm, you know, I go to church. I know a lot of Christian friends. All my friends are Christian. Tell you the truth, my family's Christian. That's pretty good. The point is, is that Christ knows your heart, and on the day of judgment, He will. There's either two ways you're going. You're either going to be in the banquet, or you're going to be thrown out, and the door will be shut. So again, looking at these foolish bridesmaids. They're in a the family, but they have no real relationship to God. That's what it would look like with a professing Christian who's truly not saved. They have no true prayer life. They have no genuine fruit. As Christians, we're called to bear fruit. And in Matthew 7, Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruit. But these professing Christians, they don't have real genuine fruit. They have no real good works. They have no true appetite for God's word and God's will. And the whole of their profession is to satisfy the eyes of men rather than please the one who sees in secret. And those are the professing Christians, the foolish bridesmaids. Now, before we end, getting close. I had it all in colors. It's going to be great. Not. So again, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul, and now remember, Paul's talking to a church that went through a lot of sin. These guys practice a lot of sexual sin. They're, um, by, in 2 Corinthians, now they're accusing Paul, like, are you really an apostle? Show us your proof. Show us your, your, uh, your resume, as, as you could say. And Paul says, you know what? You're telling me to examine myself. Am I really an apostle? I'm telling you, you should examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. You know? And so the last thing I want is for someone to not consider the cost. Truly consider the cost of being Christ's disciple. It's not easy. As we're learning in youth group, we're going through what it means to be a disciple of Christ. It means to deny yourself, to daily take up your cross and follow him. And it's not easy because your pride is just constantly pounded. <laughs> it's not fun to be humbled. <laughs> um, and yet, it's a hard life, but it is the most satisfying, most joyous life you could live. And so you have to examine yourself. Is it worth the cost? Am I truly in the faith? Now, if you have tested yourself, if you've had truly examined yourself, you don't continually, every day, am I in the faith? Am I saved? I know a person that's just constantly always, John, am, am, am I saved? Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not. That's not the way a Christian should live. And another great verse that kind of equalizes that. Yes, at some point you should examine yourself, but you shouldn't always be examining yourself. That would then show that there's a problem. Instead, in 2 Peter 1.10, it says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do, these things you will never stumble. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom, just kind of like referring back to in Matthew. You will receive... A rich welcome just like the the wise bridesmaids they received a rich welcome into into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we should be making every effort to confirm the calling of our election that means that every day our actions we should be bearing fruit we should be constantly in his word that doesn't save us that should be the effects of of our salvation, right? If you are truly saved, there would be true, real prayer, true love for God. Um, there's 
a nice little being ready for Christ's return. Now, this is referring back to the parable, but it means like true salvation, being ready for Christ's return ultimately involves one major thing which manifests itself in several areas of our lives. If we would be ready for Christ's return, we must be born again, obviously, through the saving faith in Jesus Christ. But if you are born again, this means that his saving faith in Jesus will manifest itself in every aspect of our lives. If there's no change in your life, if you make a profession of faith and you're still living like the world, then that's a moment of pause. That's a moment of, did you truly accept Christ in your life? I think it was Paul Washer that said, um, accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's like getting hit by a train. If you get hit by a train, there's going to be a big difference, right? <laughs> right? John before getting hit by a train, John after getting hit by a train, it's going to look a lot different. The same way John before accepting Christ as his Savior, John after accepting Christ as his Savior, big difference, world of difference. Um, so there should be, we should be manifesting it, uh, a Christian life. The fruit of the Spirit will begin to show, right? And it will continue. Um, we should have a desire for a greater holiness. We should have a desire to be less in sin. And that should be apparent. We should see, and you know, again, like John says, that if anyone says that they have not sinned, then they're a liar. doesn't mean that you're not going to fall. doesn't mean that you're not going to sin. But what it means is that you have a heart that's towards Christ, a heart that is constantly walking closer and closer to Christ. There might be some drops, but as long as the graph goes up, then that's, that's what we should see. Now, before we end, one other part of the Bible, and again, it's in Matthew, that seemed to go hand in hand, is in Matthew 7. And there's so many um, parallels and overlap that you see. So we just went over the, the parable of the ten virgins. Now, in this, in Matthew 7, this is right after Jesus is talking about false prophets and that you will know them by their fruit. And you can see that there's a lot of that overlap where there might be people who say that they are Christians. There might be people who say that they're prophets. But that doesn't mean that they're truly saved. As Christians, we have to be discerning. We have to be wise. We have to know them by their fruit. And so he says this. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Where did we hear that recently? Who said that? The bridesmaids. The wise ones or the foolish ones? The foolish ones. The foolish ones said, Lord, Lord. Again, it's a term of closeness. It's a term that they know who this is. This is not someone like a, a, an atheist that winds up dead and is like, oh, are you that Jesus I've heard about? They call him Lord, Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, uh, he, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do wonders and miracles in your name? And like they give a list. Like this is this is a, a group of people that they actually say, "Look, we prophesied in your name." That's got to count for something, right? Like you can't prophesy in the name of Jesus and not be a Christian, right? That's got to count for something. Haven't we? They've done miracles in His name. I mean. You got to be a Christian to do miracles, right? The power of God? Apparently not. Their qualifications doesn't count. They've driven out demons. But yet, to drive out demons, shouldn't you be a Christian to do that? Apparently not. Apparently, their qualifications is not good enough. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me. You evildoers. One that says, like, you practice lawlessness. And again, don't ever look at your walk with God and be like, 
a checklist. I do this, 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 this. Therefore, I'm a Christian. You're looking at it all backwards. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he, he looked at it as loss. He looked at all that he did, and he was like, you know, I count that as loss. I don't know if it's in Ephesians. I think so. So, or Philippians. don't ever look at your works as a means to your salvation. Your works should simply be a manifestation of your salvation. Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Don't be a foolish virgin. Don't be the people that'll be standing on Judgment Day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this, 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 this? Be wise. Have true salvation. Be ready. And again, this doesn't simply mean that we're waiting only for Christ's return. We're all going to meet Christ, either Him returning or us dying. And like both, we don't know when that is. I can't choose when I die. But we should always be ready. We should always be ready. And so I'll, I'll leave with a, a prayer. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are so wise that you give your word in different forms. We have history, we have songs, and then sometimes you give us your word in parables, these small little stories that are just filled with these nuggets of truth that just pierce the heart, Father. I thank you, Father, for my brothers and sisters here today. And I pray that they would take your word, take your word seriously, and examine their hearts if they haven't already. There's someone here today that haven't truly s looked at their heart and said, am I really a Christian? Do I really love Christ? Am I truly a disciple or am I just playing the part? Am I just looking the part? I pray that you would convict their hearts, Father. I pray that they would not be like that foolish, those foolish versions and see the door shut in front of them but that you would soften their hearts, that they would repent of their sin, see how lost they are without you, and turn to you, love you more than anything else in the world, Father, and that you would accept them into your kingdom with open arms. I pray the same for anyone listening today, Father. The time is short, whether when you return or our own lives, Father. I pray that we will be ready I pray that we would constantly trust in your strength and in your power, Father, because only you can keep us. We are not saved by our own strength. We are not saved by our works. But it's you, Jesus, who keeps us. Amen. And I pray that we will continually know your word. You say, Jesus, that whoever has my word and keeps it, he is the one who loves me. I pray that we would keep your word, that your word would be hidden in our hearts, Father. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Some people think a little bit of Christianity is good enough, eh? There's no such thing as a little bit of Christianity. And that's uh, really what these they represent, as John so clearly brought out. Those people who came before him said, Lord, Lord, have we not? What was the big problem? It was all what they had done. Have we not done this? Have we not done that? If your Christianity, if you think it is, is made up of what you do, then you haven't seen what Christ has done, and all you have is a little bit of Christianity. It, doesn't, it won't get you there. Only Jesus. When he has a hold of you, and of course, that changes everything. Your life changes. So come to Jesus. That's all I can say about that. Come to Jesus. If you're thirsty, 
come to Jesus. If you're weak, come to Jesus. If somehow you've missed the boat and you've been looking at what you've done and you think that that was enough and you just suddenly realize, oh my goodness, I'm looking at myself. I'm not looking at Jesus. I haven't trusted him really. And come to Jesus. If you're thirsty, you can be filled. Let's close with this song. Stand. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of His mercy. As He cries out to thee, we sing, cry, Lord. your heart in the stream of life let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as he cries out to come and save and thank you that you come again and thank you Lord when we really trust you that you've come to save us that Lord we're willing to give you all that you do take all and we can have that blessed assurance of salvation that can carry us through the deepest holes and the hardest places and no matter how long it seems before you come we're ready we're ready because we have you we're ready because we have taken all that is needed, and that is you, your sacrifice on the cross, and the fullness of salvation. We pray, Father, you will deliver those who are just got some religion, what looks like a little bit of light, but it's not really the true light of the world. And they would come to Jesus, come now and receive an eternal salvation that can never, ever be taken away. So they won't be caught on the wrong side of the door. We ask for this, Father, and just ask you to touch each heart. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. amen.